Good evening, St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church. It's good to see those who have tuned in tonight. Um, and those who are on the Zoom line and the phone line, it's good to have you here. Uh, we're going to prepare our hearts and minds tonight to continue. I want to take a moment to remind everyone that is listening uh, that tomorrow is the first Sunday in the month of May. And I do encourage you, pray that you will wake up or go to knowing that that's the, tomorrow is the first Sunday. Wake up with the knowledge that it is the first Sunday. But also, most of all, to know that Jesus said uh, in the last hours of his earthly ministry that we should do this meeting, bread and the wine as often as you get together in remembrance of him. And so here we have a St. Peter, <clears throat> that day that we get together as often as we remember is found on the first Sunday of every month. And so tomorrow is a sacred day uh, for us, sacred day for the body of Christ as we celebrate um, the, the love that God showed, the love that Jesus showed us, showed us and the power that God revealed to us and manifests for us uh, in raising Jesus from the dead. And as a reminder, that's why Jesus said, do this day in remembrance of me. We are reminded of the love of God, the power of God. We're also reminded of Christ Jesus. We're also reminded that this power still exists. That the power of resurrection exists in our lives and that the sacrifice of Jesus saved our lives. We are, we are saved, we're justified because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let us approach it in a sacred, sanctified manner. If you plan on coming to church, come to church, praise the Lord. If you doing virtue get up a little early and give the lord some praise before you tune in so that we may have the right heart and mind to hear what god is saying in the book of philippians the bible says that there were some and that gathered at the river uh and it, lydia was one of the names she was a seller of purple and the bible says she was a worshiper of god and she received the word as a result of being a worship of god so if you want to hear the word really receive it tomorrow worship god tonight tomorrow that we may hear and receive the word on tomorrow tonight we're in um, and the book of Second Thessalonians chapter 3, we're coming to the very close of this book. And I do encourage you as we look at these verses, we're going to redo or go over some uh, verses that we went over last night uh, to kind of refresh ourselves that we may understand more of the application. Sometimes I teach, uh, as I study um, some more, I see more uh, in these verses. And so in chapter 7, chapter 3 rather, I want to just read verse 6 because what we're going to talk about today kind of refers back to verse 6. So look at chapter 3. Verse 6, the Bible says this. <clears throat> it says, uh, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh walk disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Now, I want to just, if you would, allow me to flesh this out just a tad bit. Uh, there were those in the church at Thessalonica, and we do know that they were a church that was very time conscious. <laughs> Uh, in Deacon meeting this morning, De Deacon uh, Thomas reminded us that our time is not God time. They had, they were God, they were time conscious, and they, some of them said, "Well, since um, Jesus is coming back, ain't no sense in me doing no work." Now think about this for a second. Being a man who had not do no work, the Lord, uh, you know, He'll be back soon, so ain't no sense in me in, in, in working and taking care of myself. What I do is just lean on the generosity of others uh, in the church and others who are part of the church to take care of me. I want y'all to hear that. Now that's what's happening in Thessalonians. And so um, Paul had become aware. I can imagine that somebody told Paul, Paul, you know, everything's going good, but we got some folks who ain't working. They ain't trying to take care of themselves. They're just kind of lazy and just shiftless. And they're just looking for us to take care of them. If you remember, First Timothy, Paul said, uh, sp spoke about this. He, well, he, he, he made a declaration about this, uh, that for those who could take care of themselves, the church should not take care of. And so Paul here uh, kind of underscored this for saying, you know, there's some among you who are walking disorderly. So the disorderliness in verse 6, um, uh, was not just about behavior, like bad actions in terms of, you know, cutting up, but it was about bad actions in the, as a result of how the people of God interact with one another. Think about that for a second. When somebody's taking advantage of you or looking to take advantage of you, that's that's his, that's his orderly conduct. They are acting in a disorderly fashion. So Paul addresses that, that here in verse 6. Uh, then he moves on in verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 to address that issue of disorderliness. I want y'all to walk with me if you would. He, he says, you know how to act because you watched us. We were not disorderly. We are not laying on you or we're not taking advantage of the situation. We're not acting out of out of order of being a Christian. That's what he's talking about, out of order of being a Christian. He said, we didn't eat nobody's bed for free. We earned what we got. He said, we, um, and we could have asked for it, but we are instead wanted to be an example. Verse nine and verse 10, he said, 
even when we're with you, we commanded you that if you would not work, neither should you eat. Paul says, well, with that, we told you, you know, don't sit there and say, well, Lord's coming. I ain't got to work or somebody's going to take care of me. Verse 11, he says, now here's the problem. I hear, we hear that there are some which I'm walking among you are disorderly. They don't work at all. Look at verse 11 now, uh, but I'm busy about it. So let me, think, let me can, I, can, I, can I pass it for a second? He's saying that, that as a result of some folk, having chosen not to busy themselves with working to take care of themselves and their families. What they have become is busy about it. That means they use the energy instead of working to use that same energy to work on folk nerves. How about that one? They have, instead of working to be a benefit to people, they are still working to, to just, just, you know, just, just to drag people down and to confuse people and just to, to, to just, to just, you know, talk about other people, talk about other people. What's happening? I want y'all to picture that right now. Somebody who ain't working, but just busy working their mouth. That's what Paul was referring to. Now, Paul gives the church, the body of Christ, instruction on how to handle such people. Now, listen very carefully. Verse 12, he says, now them that are such, those that are like that, he said, we command and exhort you by our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm not telling you what I'm thinking. I'm telling you what the Lord told me to say. And this ain't the first time we said that. Paul said that throughout this, this book and also throughout 1 Timothy in, in, in various ways throughout all of his epistles. But Paul said, I'm telling you how to deal with this. That that you, I command you and exhort you by Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat all bread. Paul says, the first thing to do is to tell them the message. So if somebody's active, and I want y'all to hear this now because this is very important because this is oftentimes the, uh, and the the problem in the church in church the problem is not caused by people who are doing the work of the Lord the problem about caused by people who are not doing the work of the Lord the problem is not caused by people who are engaged in ministry the problem is caused by people who are not engaged in ministry the problem is not caused by people who are serving the Lord diligently with their whole heart and being obedient to God it's caused by folk who just at the church and in the church so Paul says this that the, we should tell them verse 12 with quietness that they work and eat their own bread. Three things Paul says we ought to tell them was quietness. Paul says that the posture is not to fuss, but to say, hey, listen, this is what you need to do. And also that we're telling them to be quiet as they work. And, and instead of talking and being busy of the mouth, that they should eat their own bread, that they've worked by being busy themselves. That's what Paul said. I'm not going to repeat that one because I think that speaks for itself. That's the message that Paul says we're to give. Verse 13. Now, this is a key verse, too, because Paul then speaks to the people that he's talking to about dealing with those who are busy about this. Paul said, now, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Now, I must, I'm just going to take, if I, y'all don't mind, I'm going to take my time a little bit tonight. I think I got a little time to work with. Paul says in this verse to the believers who are doing their work, who are serving the Lord, who are faithful to the Lord. Can I go ahead and write, write it off to you? Those who are in Bible study, those who are in Sunday school, those who are in worship, those who are engaged in ministry, those who are engaged in their own personal relationship with the Lord. He said, listen, don't grow weary in well doing. Paul, why do you, how did you know? Paul says, well, I know that it's a trick of the enemy to try to, the trick of the devil himself to try to convince those believers who are faithful faithful to the Lord, to just let, to let it slide or to back up or to get, get uninvolved or unengaged because we're watching other people not doing what God has called them to do. It's human nature. Let me be very clear. It's human nature for the Christian. No, it's human nature for people to look over and watch you doing all the work. You always at the church. You always in Bible study. You always praying. You always serving. You always doing what the Lord has told you to do. You're on three, four ministries. It's human nature to say, well, you know what? I ain't going to do all this. I'm going to say, they ain't going to do it. I ain't going to do it either. That's human nature. Paul says the Christian nature have us to say that you don't grow weary and well doing. You really don't care what they're doing because you're not doing it for them anyway. You're doing it for the Lord. That's what Paul is saying. And that's the thing that we must understand and we must understand very clearly and we must we must implement that in our lives. Do not, let me repeat myself, do not find yourself in a space or a position where you're looking around and saying, well, everybody else, I'm um, not doing it. I ain't gonna do it either. And let me tell you, this, this extends itself not just to church work, my brother and sister, but instead it is also engaged in our relations with others. Sometimes, how many of us got friends that, that they don't care they loaded the friendship? How many of us got friends who, you know, who you can't really depend on like they depend on you? How many of us got uh, family members, for that matter, who we can't depend on like they depend on us? H human nature says, leave them alone, cut them loose. Christian nature says, don't grow weary and well-doing. I think I shared this story with you recently. 
um, about a conversation that my oldest son Isaiah and I had. Um, he was telling me that, you know, he had done this guy a favor, you know, helped him out when he didn't have anything. And he said, now the guy, you know, is acting funny with him. And I said, son, let me tell you this. Let's do two things. Let's be practical. And, and, and the first thing to do is pray and ask the Lord what to do. And I said, and as God directs us, understand two things. This may be a situation where you continue or maybe a situation you stop. But the bottom line is that we never quit doing what the Lord has told us to do. We never grow weary in doing well because doing well opens the door for our blessings. So what Paul was telling the church at Thessalonica, those believers who are so active and such good stewards and good disciples, not only in the church, but even with their relationships outside the church, Paul says, hey, I know, you, I know you're tired. I know you don't feel like being bothered with them, but don't grow weary in well-doing and don't 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 give them evil for evil, as he said in First Thessalonians, and also he is saying as well, don't say I'm not going to be bothered with nobody else because of what somebody else did. That's what Paul is saying in First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, chapter thirteen, when he says, "But ye brethren, be not weary in well doing." It is always a time when somebody can say, "I ain't gonna do no more because they ain't doing their part." It ain't about that. God is not me. God measures our faithfulness as individual Christians, and so somebody's gonna get to heaven here serving God. Well done to hear something else so what i'm saying is if you want to hear certain god well done abide by 13 verse 13 but be but ye brethren be not weary in well doing look at verse 14 he said and if any man obey not our word in other words paul said if you tell them what i said tell them in verse 12 and they do not obey it um this is what you need to do note that man what does he say? No, that man means what he's saying. Just take note of them. And then he says, and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. This is a key verse because what Paul is ostensibly saying is, is that when you see somebody who just decide they don't care what, you know, because that's why Paul says initially we should go to them with the word. We should go to them and say, here's what the word says. Paul says, go to them and tell them what was said. We are going to them with the word. The word says um, that you are to work in quiet. It's not be busy about it. Take care of yourself. That's what the Bible says. But Paul says that they don't do it. They say, well, man, you know, whatever. Then your response is to note them, to say, hey, I'm identifying them. And then the next part of the verse is because he attack them, fight them, slap them, cuss them. What he says is, note them, and then have no company with them. That goes back to verse 6, where he said, withdraw. Having no company with them means that you are uh, have withdrawn, that you are from, from fellowship with them. Having no company with them, let me, because let me, I wrote a few things down, having no company with them means that that our job um, um, is, to, is, to, is to ostensibly not engage in and, and, and encourage them uh, in their behavior. That's what not having a company member. You know how sometimes we get somebody, and, and, and all of us have done it, so don't say you didn't because we all have. That somebody's dead wrong, but you say, well, you know, you know, you got to do what you got to do. That's 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 having company with them. Having company means that you just are stern and strict and saying, I'm not fellowship with you because you're out of order. I'm not dealing with you because you're out of order. I'm not encouraging you because they're out of order. I told you what the word says, so you're on your own. Now, here's the key verse to part to understand that. Paul says, have no company with them that he may be ashamed. Paul says, you're not trying to turn that person out of the church. You're not trying to throw them out of the church. Paul says, instead, you're trying to shame them into doing right. And that's, I think that's a pretty fair, uh, I mean, I think that's a great assessment that Paul has given us from God. And I think that all of us will understand that in a general sense, that that oftentimes work in, a, in, a, in practical, but it definitely works in the spiritual. If somebody has any God in them, if they have any Holy Spirit with them, if there's any spirit of God in them, that they will be ashamed to come to realize that they have lost fellowship with people who are in the body of Christ because of their behavior. Paul says, we're not trying to put people out of the church. We're trying to draw people back into fellowship. Um, he says in verse 15, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. He says, let your, your work not say you're going to attack them. And that's why I say that, because again, let me go back to human nature. Human nature means you want to get them. Christian nature says you want to admonish them. That means warn them and say, my brother, I'm telling you, what you're doing is not right. It's not going to benefit you at all. It's going to cause you and those around you a problem as long as you engage in it. Paul says that's what we should be doing, um, not um, counting that person the enemy, but admonishing them as a brother. You would treat your siblings um, differently than you would anybody else. And Paul says we're to treat them still as brothers or sisters in Christ uh, and not enemies. Verse 16, he says this, now the Lord of peace himself, I like this because Paul didn't say, um, let me read this whole thing. Paul said, now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. Paul said this. He said, I'm not really, I'm not asking the Lord to send an angel or send a preacher or send a teacher to help you get peace. I'm not even asking the Lord to send some scripture and his word. Paul says, I want the Lord of peace. That's God. 
himself to give you peace always by all means. Paul says, I want you to have as your source of peace, the God of peace himself. I think it was an interesting way to understand because in the Old Testament, sometimes the Jewish Christians had some level of difficulty with that because they saw God afar off. But Paul didn't see God afar off. He saw God close up, engaged in his life. I think I may have shared this story with you um, back back in the day, but I remember after um, my surgery, I was had gone to a doctor's appointment. I was sitting with one of my closest friends, and what he said to me was, he said, I used to be offended by how you prayed. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I always felt like you, like you, you could just talk to God. He said, but I realized that you do talk to God. And I said, no, it's just, I, I do. I said, it's me. I said, every Christian through Jesus Christ has the ability to have a conversation and communion and fellowship with God. I said, we don't have to go through anybody. I said, we just go to God. And so therefore we can talk directly to God. Paul says the same concept here. He says, we don't have to go through nobody to get peace. God himself, he said, I'm praying that God himself, the God of peace will give you peace. And Paul is not saying that as if he hopes it happens. He's saying it. He says, I'm praying that you um, appreciate, understand, and, and experience the relationship that is available. That's what he's saying. Um, he's, he's not saying that I'm hoping God does and I'm praying God does it. It's there. He's saying the church of Thessalonica, I hope you benefit by your relationship with God that you experience this peace that God, the source of all peace, gives you. He says, I pray, now the Lord of peace himself, he's saying it's a prayer, now the Lord of peace himself, now the Lord of peace himself, give you peace always, by all means. I like that. Paul says that in every situation, you'll get peace. And however, God wants to give you peace. Sometimes God will give you peace by breaking whatever you had up, but sometimes God will give you peace just by it, it speaking to your heart. But Paul says, however you get peace from the Lord of peace, he said, I'm praying that that's how you receive it in every situation. Then Paul says this, I like this. Paul says, the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token in, in every epistle, so I write. And Paul says, I'm signing this letter so you know it's from me, but look at verse 18. Paul says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Paul says, and Paul clearly has believed throughout this letter and every letter he wrote that the beginning and the end of experiencing the beauty of a relationship with God is stems from grace. The grace that we have from God through Jesus Christ is that which no other relationship offers. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what who your family is. Nobody can get God's grace for you, but you through your relationship with God through Christ Jesus. But Paul says this, then this is a, this shows how part Paul loves and how we ought to love. Paul says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. He says, even the folk I had to fuss at a little bit, the folk who kind of lazy, the folk who've been not working and being busy by, the folk who just dealing and talking. Paul said, I'm praying that the Lord's grace will be a benefit and bless you as well. Paul didn't say, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with those who do right. He didn't say, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with those who are understanding and, 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 and sensitive. He said, I want the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be with all of those who are in Christ Jesus. I thank God for tonight. I thank God for these words. It's just a tad bit early, but 724. I pray again that these words will speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. But I do pray these words would be something that we choose to implement in our lives. Uh, I got a call from a member today and it was kind of interesting. They were saying that, you know, you ain't got to talk about stuff you know people be thinking about. And I said, I'm not talking about what people I know people think about. It. I'm talking about what the Lord says in his word. And that speaks to me, that speaks to you, that speaks to us. The challenge is when we implement these things in our life. It ain't always easy, but God is calling us to do that which he has called us to do. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we come tonight, Lord, just to say thank you for another time that we have spent living in expectation in your word. And I pray, God, that this will not just be a clause or a phrase, but I pray, God, that this will be a position that we walk in that we are walking with our heads held high, lifting us above disappointment and disillusion and depression and disconnection. That we walk in expectation, Lord, of your movement in our lives. I pray, God, this word tonight will bless households, families, and individuals who are on the phone line and the Zoom line. I pray, God, this word will get in our hands and feet <clears throat> that will equip us to serve you better. Let your word get in our mouths. And let your word get in our hearts that we may be strengthened in our inner man. Let your word get in our ears so we can hear your word <clears throat> above all the ways of the world. <clears throat> let your word, Lord, get on our minds, in our minds. We might have peace. That's the pastor's understanding and the fire and dust will be quenched. Lord, let your word get on our lips, tongues, vocal, lungs, and throat. That God, we may 
uh, um, be able to declare your word to a dying world, to each other, and to ourselves. God, I pray for peace for us, joy for us, that we may rejoice in you. I pray, God, that you would strengthen us again to walk in victory. I pray, God, you build a head of protection around us and protect us from the fire and darts of Satan. And I pray, God, that you would grant us <clears throat> excitement in the life we have with you through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Hold on, Zoomers. God bless you.